G'day, Daniel here from Living Entertainment North Coast and today we really need to talk about the Chord Mojo 2 Electric Boogaloo. Now it's gonna be a little hard to talk about the Chord Mojo 2 without briefly touching on the prequel, the original Chord Mojo. So this came out around 2015 and it's just kind of been a staple here at Living Entertainment since then. Uh, when it came to recommending headphone amplifiers and DACs, it was just always an easy recommendation. It had some really cool features. It slips really nicely in your pocket. It's not that different to uh, a wallet from say a company like the ridge you know it's just a really nice little portable headphone amp and DAC and about a month ago Cord started teasing that they had a new product on the way I had a feeling it was going to be a follow-up to the Cord Mojo because it was just such a popular product and so here we go the Cord Mojo 2 it's probably worth briefly running over the things that haven't changed from the original there's quite a few elements of this particular unit that are pretty much identical and the most obvious is the fact that both of these units have two headphone outputs it's a really cool feature i kind of am surprised that there aren't more headphone amplifiers that allow for this because sometimes if you're sitting on public transport for example it's, it's nice to share your music with a, a friend if they're next to you now the other thing that you'll find that's the same outside of the chassis itself which is almost identical outside of some uh, you know form factor things here such as the uh, space where the cord logo sits i think this one a lot easier sits on your thumb now than the original one which i don't know pulling it out of my pocket made it a little bit easier to get a get a grip although again not a massive difference just a small thing to note just like the original you have an optical input you have your micro coax input you've got two micro usb inputs one for your pc and one for charging and uh, the big change of course on the mojo 2 is that now you have access to a usb c port which makes sense you know this unit did come out quite a while ago and since then USB-C has become the standard on most phones and people don't want to be having dongles hanging out of their phones it's just it's, it's not practical and it's not fun so USB-C thank you every portable DAC and headphone amplifier should have USB-C 2022 come on let's go let's make it happen in terms of things that have changed outside of that USB port obviously Something that is definitely worth mentioning is the increase in buttons here. So the original cord, you've got your three buttons along here, your on and off switch, and uh, one for, well, two for volume, obviously volume up and volume down. And um, interestingly, these buttons roll perpetually, which uh, I always found kind of distracting because I'm a fidgety person. And um, I would often, when I was using this, actually hear myself playing with these. No longer an issue with the Mojo 2. They've taken us fidgets into account and the buttons themselves, there's now four of them, and they're smaller in size, and most importantly to me, they are now fixed in position. So I'm not gonna be sitting here scrolling through these things when I'm, um, you know, stressing out or anything like that. I can just focus on my music, which is nice. But just like the original, you have your on switch, as well as your volume up and down. And there is a second, or I guess a fourth button here, which is the new inclusion. And this is uh, for a menu system of sorts. I'm not gonna be going into detail here. It's something that really needs to be shown off in uh, kind of like its own dedicated sort of little space. So we'll come back to this. But yeah, I, I definitely appreciate the differences they've made to this particular unit. In terms of critique for the new Mojo, there's only one thing I have, and it's incredibly minor, but I think some of you might be able to relate to this. As I stated earlier, I love the fact that this system has two headphone outputs. I think it's awesome. But in the headphone headspace, headphone headspace, in the last couple of years of the headphone space, there has been a, I've noticed, a large move towards balance headphone cables as an option on a lot of devices. Uh, Earmen are an example of, of a brand leading the charge in this respect at the moment. And you know, companies like Meze, and Meze is a brand that we've always recommended pairing with the Cord Mojo. But even with Meze's now, we're noticing a lot of people are grabbing the balanced cable because they do make a significant impact on the impression you get while listening to it. They, they do make them sound better in my personal opinion. Yeah, while I love the fact this has two headphone outputs, I really would have, really would have loved it if one of these was a, a, a balanced and the other one was unbalanced. 
Uh, that is like my literally my one little thing for the Mojo 2 that I, I wish was perhaps different. I'm sure Cord have their reasons why they didn't do that, but I feel like in the direction that Headfire is currently going, um, it would have future-proofed it a little bit. But you know, we can't have everything, and and honestly, I don't have anything else to complain about <laughs> in terms of this thing, which uh, takes me to how it actually sounds versus the original Mojo, because that's really what this video is all about. This is a Mojo 2 versus Mojo, and I'm doing them backwards. How are they sonically different? Well, I've got my Dan Clark Eon 2 closed back headphones here, and um, I'm gonna have a listen, and I'm gonna find out, because from what I'm told, there's been a lot of re-engineering going into these on the inside, which is where it matters. And if you're interested in those specs, I'll put the specs for both of these units here, floating above my hands. I know some of you love those numbers. To me though, I don't listen to numbers, I listen to music, and that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Now I hope you'll forgive me, I am standing here with my laptop in front of me, I took a bunch of notes and as much as I wish I could just go off the top of my head with all this stuff, I feel like I kind of need this here for reference. But in terms of what I listened to, I wanted to pick a wide spread of different genres, a bit of time period sort of stuff going on, so a few new songs and a couple of old ones. In terms of the newer tracks I listened to, uh, Big Thief's Time Escaping off their new LP, which dropped last week. And also uh, dropping last week, Zeal and Ardor's Church Burns from their self-titled album. Um, and also more recently was Mac Miller's Yeah, which was a bonus track off his uh, Faces mixtape, which dropped last year. And in terms of oldies, we got <laughs> some <laughs> oldies. Mason Williams' Classical Gas. Horrible song for head, great song. Terrible on headphones, I'll explain why would I get to it. And lastly, the Alan Parsons project, The Raven. I feel like uh, one of Alan Parsons' more underappreciated and, under, and, and not talked about enough tracks. I got a pretty good idea of the differences between these and there, there was some really subtle stuff and there was one that was just, it's not subtle at all. So I'm gonna go through the subtle stuff first because in a lot of ways that's kind of the interesting stuff, right? That's that's the minutia. And uh, using Big Thief as an example, um, using the Chord Mojo 2, there were things that were definitely, I guess what you would say, more well pronounced. Um, most notably was the kick drum in the track. There was like a lot more authority to it and a lot more clarity. It was a little bit muddy on the original Mojo and not all the Big Thief's recordings are, uh, you know, of a fantastic grade when it comes to production. That's, that's not what they're about and this one's no different. It feels very authentic and very just kind of just putting, putting it out there. You know, you feel like you're in a bit of like a homey environment, I suppose, um, with a lot of their recordings, which is important. It's part of their, their folk sound as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, the muddy kick drum's not that surprising, but the fact that it was cleared up as much as it was um, I, what was initially something I thought was part of the sound mix, it turns out was just the presentation of the original Mojo itself. And likewise, there were some little subtleties there, like a very, very slight reverb on um, Adriana Lenka's voice, which was definitely much more pronounced and noticeable on the Mojo 2 than the original. And I think the thing that caught me off guard the most with this particular track, and this isn't something that affected every track, interestingly, was the original Mojo I think I wrote down the word rigid to describe its sound stage, but it's probably not the best term, but it felt very much like it was split into three. You had, you had your center and your left and your right, and that was it with the original Mojo, whereas the Mojo 2 definitely feels like you're getting more of like, there's like that 44, 45 degree angle there right in the middle, you know, you're getting a wider spread in terms of the way the sound stage presents itself. On Mac Miller's Yeah, the bass on the original Mojo is kind of lumpy. There's kind of like a little bit of a synth lead there and it has like a blah, blah sort of thing going on. Mojo 2, that's tightened right up. You really get that pronunciation of that actual like synth lead hit. And yeah, just all around, there was a lot more openness to the actual sound itself. And again, just like that, that tightness, that snappiness that it um, kind of injected into the track as well when compared to the original Mojo was just, it wasn't as big a difference as what I experienced with Big Thief, but it was still an appreciable jump. 
Zeal and Ardor's Church Burns, on the other hand, this is the one track that I could kind of go either way between the Mojo and the Mojo 2. With the original Mojo, there was like a chunkiness, and I often associate that chunkiness with a, a, a sometimes like a lack of clarity. You know, it's like a little bit of fuzz around everything. And and for a lot of recordings, you don't want that, and I don't want that. But with, with metal, I kind of, and, and punk in particular, I, I kind of enjoyed it. Again, with the extra clarity of the Mojo 2, it pulled things out of the mix I didn't really notice with the original Mojo. Interesting things like there's 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 multiple guitars in the background through the track that in the original Mojo, they're kind of buried. They didn't really pop out that much or get my attention, but through the Mojo 2, they were really pulled out and they had a lot of space around them. There is a backing harmony throughout the track or like backing vocal and there's a very deliberate compression you can literally hear the point where the vocals top out and flatten out and with the original mojo that could be kind of distracting or annoying with the mojo 2 it didn't feel so much like it was hitting a compression limit it kind of put or revealed i should say a sort of like texture over the top of it it gave it a a sense of um What's the word I'm looking for? A sense of tactility that helped those vocals blend in better with the rest of the track and the rest of the mix. But the chunkiness wasn't there as much. So <laughs> it's one of those sort of like, you know, it's very specific to that song. Now let's get to the oldies for the oldies, Mason Williams' Classical Gas. I said earlier that it was a great track, but terrible for headphones. I should probably explain why. Uh, the sound mixing on this song is dreadful. <laughs> it's terrible. You, you, got, you got your guitar in the center here, that's fine. And then everything else is shoved into the far sides of the left and the right channels. There is nothing occupying this space. And it gets incredibly busy in, in those left and right channels because just like everything's like dumped over each other. Um, when you're playing it through a set of speakers, sounds sounds wonderful. I, I really enjoy it, but it just it just doesn't translate to headphones very well at all. And that's why I picked it for this particular test. Did it pull all that sound out of those far edges? No. But it did add enough space between those elements for it to not feel so much like a um What's the term I'm looking for? I don't want to say nightmare, but nightmare is probably not a bad, a bad way for it. But yeah, still haven't found the right set of headphones and headphone amp to go to make a classical gas sound the way I'd like it to, but um, I'm, a, I'm a step closer. And lastly, like I said, the Raven Alan Parsons project. I absolutely love this track. There's so much cool sound engineering going on in it. I didn't have a lot of complaints with this track with the original Mojo because again, it's a really well produced track. And that's what I noticed when comparing these is that Mojo 2 tends to have a more significant impact on tracks that aren't really well produced than it does on ones that are really well produced. But so that song already sounded pretty good on here, but there were a few things where you could tell sounds were getting a little bit muddled. For example, during the opening of the track, there is a, a vocoder, which is laid on top of a synth arpeggio and obviously their timing is the same. That's how beats work, but they kind of get confused. You know, like they, they kind of like, they're overlapping too much and they kind of bleed together into what sounds a little bit like, it's like one thing kind of offset in time of time alignment. Mojo 2, not an issue at all. You could very distinctly hear the difference between that vocoder and that synth arpeggio. And then there was what I thought was another synth in the background for the longest time, but there's actually a second vocoder very quietly in the background saying the same thing at a different octave. And um, yeah, I, I, up until I, the Mojo 2, I thought it was a synth, but I can tell it's actually, yeah, another vocoder in the background. So, you know, I learned something new in this song that I've listened to, like, I don't know how many times. So, you know, that's a testament to the quality of the, uh, <laughs> the, the sound coming through it. That ties into what I really want to say about the Mojo 2, because all of these are small differences between these tracks. But what isn't a small difference and carried through all of these is the amount of space the Mojo 2 has sonically compared to the original one. The original Mojo, you kind of feel like everything's kind of like, you know, really kind of trapped in here a little bit, which you kind of don't realize in a vacuum, but when you listen to the Mojo 2 and it just, everything just opens right up. 
And more interestingly, it manages to do that without necessarily making the soundstage itself any wider, because I, I didn't really feel like the soundstage had been extended past what the original Mojo did. It was just space between everything. And that's where that clarity came from. <laughs> And that degree of separation came from. And um, I think that's really cool because a lot of these other things that I've brought up comparing these tracks, there's small things you'd have to look for. Or you'd have to know the tracks really well to kind of like pick out. But I feel like you could put any track on both of these and play it to someone and they'll immediately notice the difference in space in the Mojo 2 because it is a massive gulf. Now in terms of other headphone pairings, I did try the Mojo 2 with the Meze Classics. Yeah, I mean, those Mezes have still got that warm, beefy sound I appreciate, but yeah, you definitely, you still get that sense of space. It carries across. This isn't just limited to the Dan Clarks that I tried this with. And likewise, I also tried some open back headphones, specifically the Audio-Technica ATH-R70X. These are headphones I use mostly for production stuff here, like editing these videos. Yeah, they really kind of highlighted just Again, with being an open back, just how spacious that Samix is. And also that difference in clarity, which isn't necessarily quite as noticeable with something like the Mezes. It really shines through with something like the R70Xs. Uh, no sense of aliasing or brightness to anything. If I was to do like closing remarks on this, it's, it's, it's a fun sounding DAC. It's got more detail and more clarity than the previous version, but it hasn't lost that fun factor. And uh, I imagine as an engineer, that's actually a pretty hard thing to, you know, maintain. It can't be easy to have it both ways, but somehow Cord have found a way to do it. So, you know, I applaud them for that. Absolutely. Now to wrap things up, there is a lot of things I still haven't had time to test with this. This was a first impressions video and this button up here, which I mentioned earlier, gives you access to like a DSP system, which is a pretty cool addition and I'd love to have a mess around with it. The reason I didn't talk about it through this video is because I haven't had a chance yet. This is literally my first time sitting down and listening to this and I really wanted to do it by comparing it to the original Mojo so I'd have some kind of frame of reference going forward for this particular product. Yeah, no, I, I had a really good time. This was a really fun little uh, project and uh, man, the number of, of songs, I, other songs I want to try on here, it's pretty huge. Now, thank you very much for sticking out this rather off the cuff, seat of your pants video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe, hit the bell. All of that stuff helps us out here at Living Entertainment. And of course, if you're interested in the Cord Mojo 2 or indeed any of the products that I talked about tonight, like the Dan Clark Audio, any of Eamon's products, any of that stuff, it's all on our website. And, and if you go to that website and buy from us, it does help us produce more videos. Alternatively, you could always just hit up our website directly, www.lenc.com.au and you can hit the messages button. And we are also available to chat on social media. So yeah, if you have any questions, hit me up. So thank you very much for watching. And bye for now.